Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the NPARC Spotlight webinar on Green Up at Kranji Secondary School. My name is Jayashree, and I will be your MC for today. On the 21st of May, we launched our 11th edition of Festival of Biodiversity. This is NPARC's yearly celebration of our natural heritage organized in collaboration with the Biodiversity Roundtable. This talk is one of the many activities organized in May in conjunction with the festival. Launched in 2011, Community in Nature Initiative is a national movement to connect and engage different groups in the community to conserve Singapore's natural heritage. The Community in Nature School outreach efforts started in the year 2014. And since then, many of the participating institutions have become increasingly competent in the area of biodiversity conservation. Kranji Secondary School is one of the schools that was recognized and is one of the top winners under the 2022 CIN Schools Awards. Today, we have the teachers from Kranji Secondary School, and I would like to welcome them uh, to begin the sessions shortly. We have uh, the session that would begin with the talk by the two teachers, followed by a question and answer session. If any time during the talk, a question strikes you, please feel free to send in a private message using the chat box uh, to either myself or co-host Clara. Without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Sandy Pan and Ms. May Ng. Uh, before that, I would like to uh, provide instructions for a better viewing experience for the Zoom audience. Uh, please do select uh, the side-by-side -side view in the speaker window uh, for a good viewing experience. Again, as I mentioned, uh, I would like to invite Ms. Sandy Pan and Ms. May Ng uh, to present a talk titled Green Up at Kranji Secondary School. Uh, both the teachers uh, oversee the school's sustainability initiative and through specially curated curriculum under the Design Innovation for Sustainable Living Applied Learning Program, they empower students to identify authentic issues and design creative solutions to address user needs while supporting our city in nature's vision and fulfilling the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals set out in the Singapore Green Plan. Again, I would like to remind you that any questions can be sent as a private message using the chat box to either myself or co-host. Over to Ms. Sandipan and Ms. May in to share their journey. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our sharing session at NPAC Spotlight, whereby Sandy and myself, we will share about the green art efforts at Crunchy Sec. So thank you for NPAC for inviting us to share about our sustainability efforts in our school. So this is the table of content that I'll be bring you through the slides today. So whereby we'll first cover the key focus and objectives of our of our Applied Learning Program, otherwise known as ALP, and our Biodiversity Trail Creation, followed by the Habitat Enhancement in Crunchy Sec, and last but not least, the Q&A segment. So the key focus and objectives of our Applied Learning Program, which is um, the Design Innovation for Sustainable Living in Crunchy Sec, uh, number one, we focus on design innovation, which is guided by design thinking, whereby we develop students to adopt a user-centric lens to analyze sustainable living issues, whereby they create creative, um, whereby they actually develop creative solutions to address user needs. And in terms of sustainable living, we are looking to uh, groom our students uh, to be equal stewards of the environment, whereby starting from themselves, they make conscious, uh, co conscious decisions on different aspects of their life, now, uh, the key focus in terms of sustainable living in Kranji uh, Sec, so we refer to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, UNSDG. 
uh, which is also covered in the Singapore Green Plan, whereby we broadly categorize them into three broad areas. Uh, our school actually selected nine relevant SDG goals. Uh, so the three broad areas are physical environment, resource, and people. The desired outcomes of our ALP program, uh, we are looking to uh, have scrungeons who practice sustainable living efforts at the personal level and also um, and thereby champion such, uh, such initiatives in school and also at the community. And uh, we are looking at students uh, who will actually work with their peers to design such uh, solutions to address sustainable living issues. And we hope that after Crunchy SAC, our students will be open to explore post-secondary pathways in sustainability-related industries. So this is our approach in trying to meet our goals. Number one, we have a whole of school approach to build knowledge uh, for all our students in terms of sustainable living. And secondly, we have programs to develop their skills and dispositions um, to innovate solutions. And third, we have competent staff to guide students in their innovation journey. So in which we also hope to actually build an environment that will encourage innovation uh, in our school. Last but not least, uh, we establish community partnerships um, to provide authentic setting for our students to learn, solve, and champion for sustainable living. So our uh, MPARCs, is one of our partners that we're happy to work with to provide uh, such a platform for our students. So these are our, um, so our key programs, uh, we classify them into three broad areas. So number one, to encourage dispositions for green innovation. We actually hold exhibitions in school and uh, we actually invite uh, guest speakers to our school um, to get students uh, to have more knowledge on sustainable living issues. And we do have an in-house THINK program, THINK Inquire in Kranji, to, uh, for our students to innovate solutions to address sustainable living issues. Secondly, to champion for biodiversity conservation, uh, some of our programs will include creating a bee-friendly habitat, uh, to raise awareness on Singapore biodiversity in our school compound, and also to plant pollinator-friendly plants at Bloom at Kranji, which is uh, our school garden. In terms of advocating for green actions amongst youth, uh, we're looking at our green ambassadors, uh, which is what we call our, uh, which is how we call our students, uh, who actually uh, develop hands-on trails, both physical and virtual trails at some of our nature reserves. And we do also offer platforms uh, for students uh, to discuss and to champion for climate actions through an online uh, conference. Okay, next, I'll bring you through the biodiversity trail creation that our Green Ambassadors have worked on over the years. So uh, this is the genesis of our, biodi our biodiversity trail creation. So in 2018, we identified the NPARC CIN ambassador platform for um, our students to uh, champion biodiversity conservation. So whereby our green ambassadors uh, under the guidance of the teachers developed biodiversity trail at Coney, Coney Island Park, Bukit Timah Nature Reserve and Labrador Nature Reserve. In 2019, uh, our school forged partnership with MPARCs and uh, we conducted biodiversity trail for other schools and also at OBS Project Island A Hand program. In 2020 and 2021, uh, we developed a trail booklet uh, with the help of NPARCs. And we also developed a virtual trail uh, due to uh, COVID-19, which hit us. Um, we also refine our booklet over the two years. Now, this year, we have the plan to develop a garden trail uh, at our own garden, Bloom at Crunchy. So it's an ongoing effort. This is our trail creation. Uh, our school actually uh, launched um, 
training programs for our green ambassadors uh, in a build up for them to acquire more knowledge on biodiversity efforts and also flora and fauna in Singapore uh, before they actually devise a trail. So we gain experience uh, through mock-up trails at Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, Labrador Nature Reserve and Coney Island Park. So uh, in 2019, we also um, conducted trails for the, o for the OBS Project Island at hand. So in these pictures, um, you can see our green ambassadors here uh, dressed in red, okay, uh, and with their cats. So they were actually conducting a physical trail uh, for our own students and also for members of the public. Yeah. Now, um, in 2020 and 2021, uh, we focused, uh, we pivoted to online platform whereby uh, we developed our Crunchy Marshall's virtual trail uh, because COVID hit us and we couldn't bring our students uh, out. Uh, we couldn't bring our students outdoors. So we brought the outdoors uh, to the classrooms for our students. So in 2020, we started with the post-exam activities for the set ones, whereby um, it's, it's the first-hand experience that our green ambassadors can acquire and see how they can further refine their trail. So we actually have a hybrid format, as you can see on the picture on top here, uh, whereby the students engage in a 360-degree trail, but the green ambassadors were facilitating it face-to-face. In 2021, uh, we develop and we refine our trail booklets and we further run uh, two virtual trails. Uh, the first one was for both secondary and primary school students. And the second trail was uh, mainly for the primary school students. So uh, with the experience of the first virtual trail, so uh, we also came up with um, hands-on activities for our second run uh, due to the shorter attention span uh, of our primary school students. Uh, so now I'll show you a video of how um, our Crunchy Marshall's virtual trail okay, is like.
Um, so in the video, you can actually see that there are interactive features uh, in the 360 degree uh, trail, whereby uh, the participants can actually click on it. And this is actually complemented uh, by our SLS package for the students and also our trail booklets. So now I'll pass the time to Sandy, who will be covering um, the habitat enhancement in Kranji site. Hey, thank you, May. Yeah, hi, I'm Sandy here. So uh, basically, uh, May has shared about how we have brought our grand ambassadors out to the parks and actually uh, get them to actually advocate for biodiversity conservations. Yeah, so uh, what, we, uh, what we have also realized through the process is that Okay, this involves a lot, a lot of logistics and the thing is we really wanted to spread this to a larger community in the school itself. So we decided actually to also start our enhancement of our own uh, habitats within our school. So we wanted to also bring nature closer to our students. And this is definitely in support with the city nature vision that was shared earlier on uh, when we first uh, started this talk itself. So um, basically, we were trying to actually enhance, uh, green out our garden itself and our compound. So uh, basically, we also... Um, with this in mind, we actually get our students involved. So we started with actually... Uh, this plot of land that is actually uh, between our classroom blocks. Okay, and now we call it our uh, Bloom at Crunchy, which is our school garden. Yeah, so basically we, we started planting and of course, um, it's not an easy process. There was a lot of failure in the process. Our plants start dying. So um, uh, the students learn along the way. Um, we try to examine what's the cause behind the, the, the plants dying. It's really because of the architecture of our building and the, the, the amount of sunlight that is actually on our, uh, going, coming into our, our garden itself. So um, we started to actually uh, to look at, okay, what are some of the... Uh, what are some of the things that we can do to actually overcome this constraint? So we started introducing shady plants besides the plants that are uh, the flowering plants that bloom uh, that actually grows better in uh, higher light intensity. So uh, we also started looking for partners and that's why we actually went on board MBAC Screening School for Biodiversity Program because they actually provide a lot of expertise and guidance and of course some native plants to help us to actually start off our garden itself. Yeah, so you can see from our uh, very humble beginning, okay, where we have many, many green empty spaces, we have now evolved uh, tremendously after two years of effort. Okay, and um, we have also moved on to actually uh, went on to tier two of the Greening School for Biodiversity, where they will actually develop bee-friendly habitats. Okay, so uh, we actually started introducing bee hotels into our gardens. And also, um, as the, as the, as the uh, flora stabilized in our garden, we also started um, uh, bringing in other programs like upcycling of tires, to actually uh, other initiatives that support sustainable living besides biodiversity conservation into our garden itself. So we actually work with Terra SG to actually educate our students on how they can upcycle tires and potentially use them as potting, uh, for potting in our garden itself. So um, uh, with two years of efforts, okay, uh, now our gardens do uh, have a rich biodiversity and also it has uh, different um, artifacts to showcase uh, what are the things that students can do to actually support sustainable living? Yeah, so I, I will go on a little bit into our bee-friendly habitat in our next slide. Yeah, so basically, um, this was actually our effort um, last year to actually uh, help to actually further enhance the biodiversity in the garden itself. So we realized that um, one of the things that we need to do is really to look at the, besides the flora, it's also the fall. Uh, the fauna itself. So we started looking at how we can actually attract and create, uh, attract the solitary bees uh, or pollinators here and also create a more sustainable ecosystem. So we actually got students to come on board the tier two greening school for biodiversity program, which is actually developed on a friend, bee friendly habitat. So MPAX provided the materials for the constructions of the bee hotels and uh, our students actually were able to make use of because a lot of that, uh, all our students go through design and technology curriculum in our school. So um, they actually then use the knowledge that they gained there to actually construct the bee hotels with the materials provided by MPAX. And um, students started thinking about besides um, construct, uh, besides install bee hotels, how can they actually make this bee hotel more attractive to our pollinators? So um, drawing inspiration from the fact that what draws uh, 
the the insects to the plants. They dis they hypothesize that by making it more more colorful, it will actually uh, attract the the insects over, and that's why they they propose to paint it in very uh, uh paint it in a very colorful format, and then um uh, you can see that all the three B hotels in our uh in our garden now is actually um. They are quite outstanding, <laughs> yeah. So so, but the thing is, uh, as of now, uh, we have not successfully actually um, uh, uh, capture or observe or sight um, uh, the nesting of the bees in our uh bee hotels. But we will try continue to try how we can actually uh enhance the design and things like this to actually uh make it more successful. So it's still a work in progress, yeah. So besides um. Besides the B hotel, so um, in the next slide, you can see that um, this is the outcome, like I say, after two and a half years of effort. So uh, we can, we actually now, our efforts have paid off, like we have a more vibrant uh, garden now uh, with very rich biodiversity. So you can see um, in the top uh, left corner of that itself, we actually have the oriental garden lizard as well as the yellow strip flutterer, um, the, 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 uh, the garden flies itself. So um, we also have, because of the fact that there is now um, more uh, appealing and attractive to the, to the students, a lot of teachers have been making use of the garden in the curriculum itself. So in the science curriculum and art curriculum. So what you see in the picture here is actually our art teacher actually bringing the students into the garden to observe for patterns in nature. And uh, so that they it will serve to inspire them and their artwork itself. So um, uh, our garden now has been extensively uh used in a curriculum. So for, personally, for me, I'm actually a science a bio teacher. So basically, the garden itself comes in very handy whenever we are actually teaching uh the plant topics itself because I, and also ecology. Yeah. So so it makes the lesson uh more interesting to the students. Okay, when we conducted using the authentic. Uh, materials that we found inside our garden itself. So we are in the midst of now monitoring biodiversity richness of our garden. And we are trying to also work um, to try to actually engage our school community more so that there will be more traction for students to take more actions for biodiversity conservations. So the garden is one of the things that we have been focusing on. The other thing that we have also expanded is the fact that we, we have, um, as we move on and expand our uh, applied learning program into sustainable living, we also want to touch on um, grad students to explore the different tenets of um, sustainable living. And one of it is definitely food sustainability. Something that we, uh, I'm sure in the past week, a lot of people have been talking about this after the announcement of the disruption to all our different food supply from time to time. So we really wanted uh, students to realize that actually uh, in, their F, in, their, in their greening effort, as they try to green out the school, actually they're also playing a role in actually um, uh, supporting or improving the resilience, but they can potentially uh, play a role to increase the resilience of Singapore food supply. That's why we expanded our, uh, into actually planting the edible plot as well. So our students are also looking at, okay, uh, with constraints that they are seeing in urban uh, farming itself, what, how can science and technology be used to overcome all these constraints? So um, that is something that uh, we are getting our students to explore. Yeah, and of course, um, this picture here shows the different four labels that we have now using very traditional farming methods. But we are definitely hoping to see how we can use science and tech to actually make this farming more, uh, more efficient and more effective. Yeah. The next part. So besides the different the gardens itself, okay, we also have the biodiversity learning wall, which has been set up to showcase the various efforts that the school has taken so far to support sustainable living. So it also showcased the artifacts of our programs like the biodiversity trails and then um, the artwork of our students in doing upcycling. Okay, and of course, um, the different, like the, the one that you see, the mosaic is actually part of the hands-on activities that our students actually conduct while they are doing the trails um, that May was sharing just now. So um, this serves to build a sense of pride in our students because they can see that what they are doing, uh, the school recognizes it the school sort of like uh create a corner to really honor it okay and i think what's more important is in this process besides um creating a pride in our green as ambassadors definitely this serve as a learning ground for our students to learn about biodiversity as well yeah so so we try to have different um things put in place to support students to learn more about biodiversity uh, uh and sustainable living in our school 
So in the next part, besides all this uh, hardware infrastructures, we also, uh, like May shared earlier on, put in different programs and seminars um, to actually um, uh, get our students to learn more about biodiversity. So we have actually held seminars in collaboration with Republic Poly. And this has reached out to about 700 participants from secondary schools in the past one year itself. So um, we in this environment seminar, we have topics that covers uh, things on biodiversity, the need for biodiversity conservations, both on land. And you can see that on the next slide uh, in, the, in the water bodies as well. So under uh, marine conservations as well. So we really hope that uh, we expose our students through different programs to the need of why there is a need to really support sustainable living itself. So we, we hope to really um, uh, open them up so that they know um, what are the different things that they can do okay, to, make, um, to help tackle uh, uh, issues like climate change, okay, um, resource constraints, and things like this. Yeah, so... Um, Actually, that with that, actually, uh, we've come to the end of our presentation itself. Yeah, so uh, please feel free to to to, sh to uh, give us any feedback or if you have any questions, uh, we'll try our best uh, to address it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. May and Ms. Andy, for uh, this very inspiring sharing. We actually have a lot of uh, questions. And um, so I hope you can uh, provide more information to our audience. Uh, today's audience includes both uh, educators and the general public. So we have a mix of questions from uh, both these groups of people mm -hmm. as well. We'll start with the very first question, uh, a specific one about how the training for your green ambassadors are done. Uh, could you share like a mock-up portion of what is covered and is this training led by teachers or do you engage a vendor to do this training? Okay. Um, so in terms of the training for the green ambassadors, uh, what we do is uh, we help to expose them to the city in nature uh, vision first. So uh, being uh, student leaders as well, right? So we actually give them a, a lot of autonomy to go and find out and also to present uh, during these uh, training sessions to gain confidence in uh, speaking to people. Yeah, so uh, it is actually uh, led by teachers in the ALP, the, the, the Applied Learning uh, Program uh, in our school. So it is uh, not run by vendors. Yeah, so in terms of the mock-up trail, I think what we meant by mock-up is that um, we start small, and whereby our students are given um, the information, they went read up. So we went on um, guided tours by N Parks first for students to gain knowledge on the flora and fauna. Then uh, after which uh, in groups, students actually uh, brainstorm of activities to engage uh, participants on such trails. When then over the years, uh, they actually modify and they think of um, other hands-on activity because we pivoted to, on, uh, to the virtual platform. So um, they actually have to modify some of these activities to engage uh, the, particip the, the participants over Zoom. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Actually, the next question is related to, uh, to your answer that you just gave uh, mm. about moving to the virtual platform. Mm. The question is, are there any differences in learning outcomes between designing a physical trail versus a virtual trail? Uh, I think in terms of learning outcomes, uh, for us, the learning outcomes remain the same, whereby we are looking for a platform for our students to actually uh, be confident speakers and also uh, to learn how to engage the audience. Yeah, so um, whether there are differences in doing a virtual trail and a physical trail, um, there are. I think for virtual trail, the challenge lies in uh, engaging participants um, through a screen and whereby um, depending on who your audience are. So for us, it was uh, primary school students whom uh, we also realized um, through conducting the first run that um, they may find it a challenge to toggle between different platforms. 
So we uh we so in the second round we cut down on that. Then uh because of short attention span as well, so we also put in uh hands-on activities for them. Yeah. So uh but definitely uh going forward, uh I think physical trail, we want the students out in nature and we also want to bring the public, you know, uh, in the nature reserves. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So the next uh, question is, you mentioned about uh, involving the students to conduct mm -hmm. the trails for uh, the general public as well as students from other schools. Mm -hmm. uh, did you also involve the parents of these students in any of the programs. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay, so our, our program is about two years old, and so if you trace back, it is really um, it started off about two to three years old, so it started off towards the end when the pandemic was starting. So we have not really um, uh, get the uh, parents in to actually uh, uh, participate in a trail itself, but I think uh, a lot of them, their parents actually supported them in the construction of the knowledge. Yeah, so basically, uh, as they were doing their research and finding out, the parents support them in that process. And I think that that support was important. But I guess if you're talking about their physical appearance in the trail itself, currently, uh, this is something that we are striving towards because of the loosening uh, in SMM and things like this. We now can bring in more parents to actually be engaged. And that is something that we definitely would love to do. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so again, more questions uh, with the trails and mm. specifically the virtual uh, trail that you had developed. Um, so we have a question on the specifics. What exactly was the technology involved in making the 360 degree virtual tour? <laughs> and uh, so do the participants actually need one of these uh, VR headsets to be able to experience this? Um, and what app is this hosted on? I guess we might have some teachers who are looking into <laughs> adopting this, I think, from the yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So 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 actually there are a lot of 360 uh, degree platforms out there. So the one that uh, we use are, uh, is Kula, K-U-U-L-A. Yeah, so uh, we started with um, another platform actually. Yeah, but, um, but that platform actually closed down. Yeah, so we uh we switched to the other one. Yeah. yeah. So um actually uh participants like if you have scanned the QR code during the video, uh participants uh, do not actually need an account, and um they also do not need the VR headset, although it may enhance the experience, um, for the participants lah. But it is actually completely doable just on your screen. But I think one of the things that we have invested in is our 360 camera. So that one mm. was uh, something that you need to have as your hardware to start with la, to, to, so that you can actually capture. And then from there, um, the rest of it is a lot of like software and the things that you do. So what you see is really the hard work of the students and the teachers um, to actually lay in all the information. Yeah, mm. so, so um, that, that itself takes, takes quite a bit of, uh, uh, of time. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is actually on who the students are who are in, involved in the enhancement of the school garden that you showed, like beautiful garden, and it's amazing to see how it is being used for your curriculum as well. Uh, are these students from a CCA group or are they the green ambassadors uh, that you mentioned uh, as part of the applied learning program? Okay, so actually all the students that we have on this program, because uh, we earlier shared that actually this is actually our school's applied learning program. So it's open to all students. Yeah, so uh, we, do, we don't really have a green club CCA per se. So uh, we actually will, uh, everyone is exposed to um, sustainable living in SEC 1 because of part of that think program where they learn design thinking skills and also learn about sustainable living. And after they go through that program, um, every year, uh, every level itself, we actually have a sustainable exploration program for them to explore on one of the nine, uh, two to three of the nine uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals that we have uh, focus on in our school itself. So every year they will focus on two to three. So through this broad uh, explore, uh, exposure, we then advertise to our students what are the different programs we have in our tier 2 applied learning program and students will then sign up 
yeah, based on their interest. So we have uh, we tell them that oh, we are actually uh, thinking of installing bee hotels in our garden, and then we will say who uh, will go to the level and say who would like to volunteer. And then we have um, the trail developments. They will be asking students uh, who will be interested in trail. So, so basically, we it is a sign out basis. Yeah. So so students. Um, I think what what. What works for us in this case is really the fact that students who sign up, students who truly are passionate, who wants to do something, yeah, um, who don't want to take some actions. And so I guess despite their heavy commitment in the curriculum and the, and the CCA, they will find time. Um, although um, it's, it's, it's challenging. We don't say that it's not challenging. Yeah, they, 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 they do really try very hard to balance. But I think the passion was an important part that kept thing going. And they really do not mind going the extra mile to really go uh, search more, do more. Yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's uh, how we work here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we have a more... Uh... You know, a question that many of our audience would be uh, interested to know, which is uh, how do you manage to combine, um, you know, both the academic and the extracurricular activities and all these things that you mentioned when it comes to implementing the green initiatives uh, in your school? So maybe some tips on how you navigate these challenges to also be useful for our audience. Mm. Okay, I think we don't claim to be experts, but mm. I think how we started off with is uh, we're trying to find alignment. I think mm. um, I think this should be an educator who's concerned about um, duplicating efforts, perhaps. And um, so what we try to do is we try to find alignment to the curriculum. Uh, then after which we also try to find alignment to uh, different programs that we run in school that can perhaps uh, hit uh, multiple objectives at the same time. Yeah, because I think we recognize that the time uh, of both students and teachers are limited. So uh, that's how I think our team tried to do it. Right, Sandy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially for our exploration program, we really try to look at where are the similar topics, which curriculum covers those topics, and then, uh, we try to weave some into a curriculum, and then after that, we will get the 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 teachers are definitely willing to partner you when you are able to extend their um what they have actually been covered in their curriculum and get yeah the students more intrigued. Yeah, so so that that definitely save us some effort in buy in. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing to see, especially like to, to see the uses of these gardens and the programs that you do from a scientific approach uh, to it being used in art classes as well. So, so we do see that there is a huge variety of use and maybe with this, there is also greater support that comes in from different departments to execute uh, your program as well. We'll just take one last question and it's a very simple and a fun uh, question whether your students have access to binoculars and any other uh, camera kind of equipment to look at the birds in crunchy marshes. Um, because especially looking at the virtual tour, there is like a lot of detailing and uh, no information that is being provided. Uh, how did the students get access to these? And do you provide these as well? <laughs> so binoculars, yes, they do have binoculars. Mm -hmm. Uh, cameras wise, uh, yes, we do have a media production team in our school, but uh, if we are talking about bringing them out to the marshals to take photographs, uh, which is something that we are also exploring, uh, because mm -hmm. from what we understand, um, there's also certain timing that we have to uh, bring our students out in order to catch uh, this uh, bird. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you so much. And I think uh, we have addressed actually all the questions that came up uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, uh, with this, I would also like to thank the participants for being so engaging uh, with today's talk and uh, giving a lot of interesting questions. And I hope uh, sharing by Ms. May and Ms. Sandy also inspired some of the educators in our audience to start similar uh, initiatives within your school premises as well. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, Ms. May and Sandy from Kranji Secondary School for this sharing. For those of you who are viewing this talk today, if you would like to know more or if you liked watching this talk and um, 
would like to watch similar talks, please go to our NPACS YouTube channel and there are various such talks available. In fact, today's talk would also be later posted in our YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and listen to it or share with your peers, uh, please feel free to do so. With this webinar, we have also wrapped up our NPAC Spotlight sessions for Festival of Biodiversity. As I mentioned, the festival was launched last Saturday, and we still have some of those exhibits in uh, Singapore Botanic Gardens at Botany Center Green Pavilion. So if you do have the time, please drop by by the end of this month to have a look at some of the information being displayed there. If you like today's talk or if you like to do um, some feedback and provide us with some suggestions on how uh, and what kind of sessions we can do in future, please scan the QR code and let us know. Uh, with this, I would like to thank everyone, the speakers and our audience for joining our session on a Saturday morning. Thank you so much and have a lovely week ahead. Thank you very much.